In a case about an accident that took place in an area with so many questionable characters, it may be surprising to learn that the most scrutinized people are actually the law enforcement in the area. Alleged to be guilty of everything from coldness to ineptitude all the way down to murder, the police officers tied up in these allegations have seemingly done themselves no favors in an attempt to clear their own names. Suspicions lay on four that are either confirmed or suspected to have been at or around the crash scene. First is first responding officer Cecil Smith. What we know for sure is he reports himself as the first officer on the scene at 7.46 p.m., where he speaks to the Westmans, Butch Atwood, and second responding officer, state trooper, John Monaghan, in a brief conversation. Monaghan leaves to attend to other duties, and Cecil heads west on 112 to look for Mora. The first problem arises with witness Karen McNamara, whose story puts her on the scene around 7.37 to 7.38 p.m. and sees an officer on scene in Unit 001, a full 8 to 9 minutes before police logs show Cecil's arrival. Many believe this to be Cecil's boss at the time, Haverhill Police Chief Jeff Williams. So we now have three possible officers at the scene. Let's take a look at why suspicions lie with each of them. First, John Monaghan. While his involvement in the case seems to be minimal at best, where problems arise is the lack of disclosure of his presence on the scene. Family initially believed that Cecil Smith was the only responding officer and heard nothing of Monaghan's stop by. It was only later it was learned that Monaghan did indeed stop and speak with Cecil Smith at the scene. And since Monaghan was initially not allowed to give a public statement, questions began to arise as to why this wasn't made public, what he did on the scene, and where his report was. It would only be later on an oxygen report that John Monaghan would state what he did on scene that night. But by then, much speculation had begun to swirl as to why it took so long to reveal this, and continues to until this day. Next is Cecil Smith, who has done himself no favors in the way of suspicion. While being the first responding officer would unavoidably throw him in the lion's den in this regard anyways, Cecil would also make a couple decisions to hurt his own credibility, ranging from confusion over his actual arrival time at the scene and his choice to only go west in search of Mora when she was reportedly headed east. But those suspicions would pale in comparison to what would happen 15 years later in early 2019. Right around the time that authorities were planning to dig up a local home in search of remains, the lead investigator on Morris' case goes and pays a visit to Cecil to have a talk with him. And that very night, Cecil Smith commits suicide. Next up is Cecil's boss, Haverhill Police Chief Jeff Williams, the man whom many suspect Karen McNamara saw as the actual first responder on the scene. Rumors initially began to swirl when family and friends say Williams was callous and cold when questioned about the case. Like Cecil before him, Williams did himself no favors in this regard, as he was not only a reported alcoholic, but he was even pulled over later by Cecil Smith, his own subordinate, for being drunk and speeding and lost his job because of it. However, as the title of this video states, three new witnesses have come forward and placed Jeff Williams away from both the accident scene and where he lives. He also appears to have been with others throughout the duration of this time period. Much of the information in this video is a covering and refreshing of simple bullet points on the case. For a much more in-depth look at not only the police officers and their suspicions, but also the new witnesses for Jeff Williams, I invite you to check out Scott Aaron and Ethan on the 107 Degrees podcast, where in the next episode they will be covering this topic much more in depth than I am. They are also the party responsible for speaking to the three new witnesses, so I implore you to both check out and subscribe to the 107 Degrees podcast in anticipation of the episode. They do a great job.
So go ahead and check out their back catalog as well. I've saved the fourth and final officer related to the case for last, as he is neither a logged responding officer nor an officer in Haverhill. Instead, he is an officer out of Franconia, New Hampshire. His name is Bruce McKay. While not confirmed on scene, McKay's odd habit of operating outside his jurisdiction, combined with a few odd choices that night, have made many an amateur investigator decide to shine the spotlight his way. Let's take a look. At 7.08 p.m., Bruce McKay makes a call to dispatch asking for the phone number for SL-16 Parquet Grave. Now this could mean one of two things. The state of New Hampshire assigns each liquor store a number, and Budson's liquor store in Haverhill is number 16. This is significant because we know Mara did stop somewhere for alcohol, and she would have been right in that area in this time frame. However, there is also a state liquor inspector named Parquet, so including his name in the call could also indicate he was attempting to contact the inspector. Whichever of the two it was, we don't know why he does this, and investigations to uncover it are ongoing. At 7.20 p.m., McKay is dispatched to what is deemed a serious level call and begins to head towards Lincoln for it. At 7.27 p.m., Faith Westman makes her call about Morris' crash. Then suddenly, at 7.28, one minute later, Bruce McKay inexplicably calls dispatch and says he is actually not going to the call and sends another officer in his place. Then he goes dark. Radio silence for two hours. Until this day, no one knows where he spent those two hours. He never seems to give any reason for it, and no one seems to even ask him. After the two-hour dark spell, Bruce comes back online to call dispatch for a number for a local motel, and we never hear a word about where he was. And Bruce McKay, by almost all accounts, is a shady dude. As mentioned previously, he had gotten into trouble for operating outside his district on multiple occasions. He also seemed to have quite the obsession with writing tickets for motor vehicle infractions, racking up something near 300 in the time span his two partners wrote 12 combined. His ball-busting tendencies would continue, and in fact even possibly contribute to his own demise, as Bruce was shot dead by Leco Kenny after pulling him over and chasing him even after Kenny had filed harassment charges against him, which should have prevented Bruce from pulling Kenny over without a super supervisor. But he did it anyway, again ignoring the rules, and it resulted in a fatal shooting by Kenny that would take Bruce's life. All in all, there are many factors related to each of these four men that could consider you to lean either way regarding their involvement. I encourage you to start with the general information provided in this video and to build upon it by doing your own research, and again by checking out the upcoming 107 Degrees podcast. As for where I lean, I haven't yet made a decision. I just feel heartbroken that out of all places this poor girl broke down somewhere where even the police have so many questions attached to them. But for now, the investigation continues. I'll see you guys next time.